Hello everyone, uh, hi Charlene and uh, Martin in the chat. Uh, with me today is Dr. Uh, Gary Train, uh, historian and uh, author of uh, Naked Statues, Fed Gladiators and uh, War Elephants. Uh, so, Dr. Rain, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great, Carl. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I've been a long time viewer of your channel, and uh, it's great to talk to you. <laughs> oh, likewise. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you mind telling us a bit about yourself and how you got uh, to uh, the classics and the, the classical period in the first place? Sure. Um, yes, I think like most people who, who love history, you can't really remember when you started loving history. It was always just kind of there. Um, but when I was uh, 14, I went to Rome for the first time. And, you know, for an American, it's a big deal to go across the sea, you know, and get to Italy. But uh, that, that first visit to Rome left a huge impression on me. And I think that that was the beginning of my, my long affair with uh, the Greeks and the Romans. Um, so in, in college, my, my major was classical languages, Greek and Latin. And I'm going to get my, my doctorate, my PhD um, in Greek and Roman history. And uh, since then, instead of doing what you're supposed to do and teach Greek and Latin at a college, um, I've gone on to do this thing on YouTube um, where I have this channel, Told in Stone, um, on which I present different topics on mostly Roman history um, to just the YouTube audience. And I wrote that book, of course, as well, a couple of years ago, uh, Naked Statues, which is a lot of fun. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've kind of become a public historian um, all about ancient history and the Romans in a special. Uh, hi, Tina and uh, Stephen. So uh, one of the things I really like about your channel, apart from, your, uh, from, from the tone of your presentation, is uh, that you uh, work a lot on uh, uh, the daily lives of people rather than, uh, you know, it's not, the way I remember history, is in, history in school is like, uh, this thing happened, and then on this day, this thing happened, and then on this day, this thing happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, you kind of uh, humanize uh, the people in history, which makes them so much more interesting. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that so often in history, you know, here in America, too, it's the same way. Where history classes are just, you know, name, date, name, date, name, date. <laughs> and uh, people end up, you know, hating history because they just remember it as something you have to memorize. You know, it's not about the people, which is what makes history, like you said, fascinating. Um, so, yeah, obviously, you know, everyone loves Julius Caesar, everyone loves Augustus. These are fascinating people. But I think what makes history come to life um, is the people who are not Caesar or Cleopatra or, you know, whatever else. The people who just did, you know, live their lives, you know, best as they could as a farmer, you know, as a slave, um, as a soldier, whatever, whatever their life might have been. And, yeah, I, I do my best in Told and Stone to try and bring those lives onto the screen. Um, I use things like inscriptions, for example, um, or the traces they leave in our texts. I try to make that uh, a fuller world, just one lived by emperors and senators and gladiators, um, who are great, <laughs> but just you know, such a tiny part of the whole you know tapestry of Roman history. Sure. Uh, speaking of uh, Roman history, because uh, I know that uh, in your channel you've gone from uh, pre-Roman to uh, well into the uh, Middle Ages, mm -hmm. because. Uh, how, uh, where would you find the uh, Greek and Roman period to be? I know that in some cases uh, it mm -hmm. goes on, some people measured by the uh, fall of Constantinople. Right, right. But where, um, does it, where does it start and where does it end, roughly, uh -huh. in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. And it really is a matter of opinion because, you know, periods are convenient for us as historians. You know, we can use them to talk about big spans of time, um, but they are just artificial. You know, they're, they're conventions. And so for the Greeks, you know, we always talk about, you know, the Greeks that we think about are the Greeks of the archaic and classical and Hellenistic periods, which is roughly about the year 800 BC, give or take, um, until often the year they give as kind of the end of Hellenistic Greece is either the fall of Corinth to the Romans in 146 BC or the Battle of Actium, where, of course, Octavian, the future Augustus, defeats Mark Antony and Cleopatra, queen of the last Hellenistic Greek kingdom in 31 BC. But for the Romans, uh, when their, you know, period ends, it's, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, so yeah, there's 476 AD is when the Western Roman Empire falls, you know, when the last boy emperor is dethroned. Um, but some people would look to the reign of, say, Justinian, you know, who dies in 565 as being the last real Roman emperor. Um, or Heraclius, who dies, um, you know, in 642. Um, or even around, you said, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Um, 
So I guess for me, you know, I, I have no problem with those artificial dates. You know, they're, they're useful. You know, they're, they're, they stick in the mind, you know, these, these big things, um, even though I don't like the name and date model of teaching history. <laughs> but, as I said, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Rome, you know, in many ways, of course, is still with us today. And it didn't really fall in the sense that, you know, the language is still around, you know, Romance languages, you know, Latin, Roman law, all the other things. The Roman legacy has such an enduring impact on European history that uh, in some ways, you know, it hasn't fallen yet. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, even with uh, even if we go uh, further back than the present date, uh, I, f I especially found the uh, interactions of the people in the uh, let's call them the mid Middle Ages, but uh, the people of the Middle Ages with uh, Roman artifacts. Uh -huh. I, it's not just the statuary which uh, they kind of hoarded, but I re remember in particular the uh, the one about how did a Roman toilet end up in uh, <laughs> in, a, in a museum. Uh, that was one of your videos, and <laughs> oh, I yes, found that yes, totally yes. hilarious. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Yeah, just for, for anyone who didn't see it. Um, so in the Middle Ages, um, someone, the popes, or one of someone who worked for the popes in Rome, found this very elaborate Roman toilet seat made of red marble. And it's a very fancy toilet, but it's still a toilet. Um, and they brought it to the pope's palace and made a throne out of it. Um, and, and they couldn't really explain the slot for the toilet seat, um, but that was just kind of a strange chair. Um, and so they had all these strange explanations. You know, this this legend arose that they had to check the Pope's gender by kind of groping them through the hole. It's this whole strange thing. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so they just didn't understand. It was just a very fancy latrine. And <laughs> it became part of the Pope's paraphernalia for centuries. Okay, I see Tina Martin, Sertman Brick, Lawrence Davies, Dungeon Matron, Ertman Brick, and T with Tyler have joined us. Great to see you all. So, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Ryan, you can uh, drop them in the chat. Mm -hmm. Try to uh, catch as many of them as you can. And yeah, of course. Of course, I'll also drop in a link to uh, your book in the chat so everyone can find it. Thank you. All the links and dropping are also in the uh, description, by the way, should anyone want to uh, find them later. So, uh, uh, you talked about where where you uh, about the time time timelines more or less, but uh, do you have any particular favorite uh, emperor or period or uh, fact that you uh, mm. like above all the others? Yeah, I mean, so when I was still um, in academia, you know, so after I finished graduate school, I taught for two years um, at the University of Michigan and a few other places. And um, so in that time, I studied um, the Middle Roman Empire, the High Roman Empire, um, really the, the first from about, let's say, the year 70 or so to about the year 230 AD. It's kind of the, the apogee of Roman power. Um, and my favorite topic um, at that time was always Roman architecture. Um, my dissertation was all about um, how the Romans built, or rather how Roman, the Roman subjects, the provincials, but these very elaborate cities um, in uh, above all what's now Turkey and what these elaborate public buildings mean, why they invested so much money in these, you know, marble columns and, you know, bronze statues. And, and so I think for me, the, what always fascinated me most was kind of this period where Rome seemed to be on top of the world where, you know, Rome really did rule from, you know, Scotland to Syria um, and had all of this wealth to throw into projects like, you know, these cities, these, arch these, arch these grand, architectural projects um, and thinking about architecture um, as a language of power, of imperialism, um, of the Romans talking to their subjects and those subjects talking back. And so that was always the thing I found most fascinating um, were the buildings the Romans left behind. Um, of course, some of which are so enduring thanks to things like concrete that they're still around today. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that if I had to pick one thing, um, that was the part that always drew me most um, was the, the physical side of uh, the built environment of the Roman world. Is that why your channel is called uh, Told in Stone? Yes, it's part of it. Um, actually, I, I workshopped, I had a list of about 15 names. And I showed all of my <laughs> friends and family um, these different names, and one of them was Told in Stone. And that one won, I did a, a poll, kind of a vote on uh, which one to pick. <laughs> and Told in Stone won the vote, and so it became Told in Stone. <laughs> yeah, you just mentioned uh... It's surprising how much money they had to throw at these public buildings. I remember recently you uh, <clears throat> tried to estimate how much it would cost to build the uh, Colosseum today. Oh, yes. Yes, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, 
you know, I, I began by estimating how much we think it cost initially. And we have no idea, you know, no, no one kept these accounts that, you know, and I'm not a historian <laughs> about these things, but I ended up guessing that it cost something like a hundred, a hundred millions of sturtii um, at a time when a Senator, um, you know, the richest man in the empire had to have only a fortune of a million of sturtii. So it's, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's probably less, which is interesting than the annual budget of the Roman army. You know, so the, the real expense for the Roman emperors was not things like the Colosseum, though they were very expensive. It was paying the troops um, every year between three two thirds and three quarters of their money was going right to the army and to keeping that huge force uh, paid and you know not coming to Rome to kill the emperor. <laughs> three quarters of the economy. Yes, three quarters of the, of the yeah, emperor's budget is going right to the military, um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's pretty incredible that that much is just going to one thing. And buildings are kind of icing on the cake. You know, they're important and they they, they mean a lot for the emperors to build. You know, it's a good way to. Show the city of Rome how much you care. If you build this big arena, we can do things like, you know, have, you know, lions attack, you know, uh, prisoners or whatever. Um, but but it's really just, um, you know, it, that's all for show. The real action is paying the troops, keeping them loyal to you. And that's what makes the empire work. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Think about the budget and how all that comes together. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, so, uh, hi, Cross from Campaign Terrain. And we have a question from Ertman Brick. Mm -hmm. What were the biggest influences culturally to the Greeks and the Romans? Well, for the Romans themselves, it was the Greeks far and away. R Roman culture is in so many ways just kind of a, a facsimile copy <laughs> of Greek civilization. It's not just that, of course, but you know the, the Roman civilization grew up very much in the shadow of Greek culture. And any wealthy Roman um, for 500 years was bilingual. They knew both Latin and Greek. They were expected to. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Romans kind of adopted Greek culture as their own to the point that their own, their gods, of course, um, became identified with the Greek gods. You know, it was a total like, uh, I want to be like this civilization. And they just kind of copied the Greeks while, of course, conquering them and slaughtering them. But also, you know, in kind of a details. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, details. Right, right. Um, you know, for the Greeks, um, they were profoundly influenced by the ancient civilizations of the Near East, by Egypt and Syria. Um, this happened early in their period, early in their history, in the 7th century BC, above all, what we call the uh, Orientalizing period, uh, because it came from the Orient, uh, from the East. So like uh, a Greek sculpture, for example, um, the first Greek sculptures are copied from Egyptian sculpture, um, as uh, many of the patterns in their vases are coming from the art of Syria and Egypt. The Greeks are always, of course, very different in a lot of important ways from those civilizations, but they copy important things from them early on. Um, even their myths, some, so like uh, Hesiod is a Greek author who writes about um, like the, the Greek creation myth, for example, and the Titans and the gods. And um, his, the way he tells the story is modeled in many ways on the Syrian creation story. Um, and, and so there is um, a period in which the Greeks are very receptive to influence from the East. But after the Persian Wars, when they fight the Persians, you know, Xerxes and Darius and those guys, um, they begin to identify themselves in opposition to the East, to the Persians. And so they kind of um, swear off all of their, those influences, even though they're still very important. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's a good question, in other words. Bo both civilizations are profoundly influenced by others. In the Roman case, by the Greeks, and the, the Greeks, those who are further East and older. Okay. Uh, thinking about it, uh... Didn't the Romans also consider like uh, the uh, eastern parts of the empire once they conquered them as something being more exotic or interesting? Mm -hmm. uh, I found it interesting because it's like usually we think of a capital as <clears throat> sorry, things where mm -hmm. stuff happens and everywhere else is the uh, backwater. But mm -hmm. for the Romans, it seemed to be kind of the other way around. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, the eastern half of the empire, um, which is you know, let's say everything that's kind of from Greece on eastward, you know, so Greece, Turkey, Syria, uh, what's now Israel, Egypt, um, all of that was the wealthier half of the empire. It was more civilized in the sense of being having many more cities. Um, and so, you know, in the West, you know, what's now, um, you know, Spain, France, Britain, the Romans were the first civilized, you know, civilizing in the sense of city building power. They were the first people to come in and establish this urban civilization. In the East, they found that waiting for them. Um, and so that, that was always the, the, the wealthier half of the empire. And in a place where kind of the, the cultural center of gravity was in many ways, of course, they moved the capital to the East eventually, to Constantinople. Um, and, and so 
Yes, um, the Romans are profoundly interested in places like Egypt, which is their wealthiest province, and where a lot of the grain for the city of Rome comes from, of course, um, and become very attuned to the fact that if they lose that part of the empire, um, everything they've built is pretty tenuous. You know, Britain, for example, is a money is a province you lose money on. So it costs more to hold it than to actually actually ever get from it. You know, they're paying all these troops and they're getting nothing from Britain, a little bit of tin, maybe, you know, tin or iron, but that's it. You know, where a place like Syria or Egypt is giving you a lot of taxes, um, a lot of uh, grain, you name it. Um, and of course, eventually emperors come from the east as well. Um, so beginning, you know, with uh, Septimius Severus, his wife is from Syria. Um, and then we have a whole dynasty of Syrian emperors, followed by Philip the Arab, um, other Easterners. So there is a very, um, besides just the, the material wealth of the east, there's just a flow of people at the top coming from the east into Rome. Um, and kind of keeping this uh, idea of a unified empire going. Let's see. Hmm? Yeah, I think uh, that actually clears up for me because I had been wondering about that for some time. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm glad I can help. Yeah. No, it's a fascinating topic. Okay, and we have a question from uh, T. Witt Tyler. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'm currently making a Roman Colosseum diorama. Done mm -hmm. a lot of research and visited Rome. That's dedication mm -hmm. to crafting. <laughs> yeah, really, right. But is it true that they actually worked out underfloor heating, or was it just attributed to them? So they had underfloor heating? I think it's whether the, the Romans invented it, or was it something that they oh. uh, swiped so off someone else and then it got credited oh, yes. to them? Oh, yes. No, that, that, that is correct. The Romans didn't <clears> invent, <throat> invent underfloor heating. Um, there was a, a wealthy Roman equestrian. Um, I think it was Sergius Orata. You can check me on that. Um, so he was trying to to have establish these oyster pools and we could grow oysters and keep the, the pools warm all year so the oysters would grow faster. So we had this idea of building these furnaces um, with pipes leading from them, these hollow clay tiles, like a kind of a like, like almost like a sewer pipe, um, but made of terracotta, made of clay, um, which would funnel the hot air from the furnaces into the walls of this oyster pond to keep it warm. And this gave him the idea to start using the same technology, these furnaces with these hollow clay pipes funneling hot air for houses. And he became very rich installing these in-floor heated floors um, for you know, wealthy Romans in the villas around Naples. Um, it was always kind of rare in private houses. Only the wealthiest Romans could afford in-floor heating because you had to have a furnace going at all the time. That meant you're burning a lot of expensive wood or charcoal. But the baths, the Roman baths, um, almost always had the bigger ones um, in floor heating, and the pools are heated by the same way, um, by these hollow tubes behind the walls of the, the pools, keeping the water warm um, through this forced air from the big furnaces. Um, and in fact, the floors were so hot in the Roman baths, they had to wear sandals, these like wooden clogs. I was their, their feet would get scalded because the, the tile got so hot um, from this uh, superheated air um, flowing beneath the floor. So yes, it is true. Uh, the Romans invented that, and it became a big part of their civilization in some ways. I always find it fascinating how uh, we look at something and <clears throat> it sounds like it would be something pretty modern, but uh, nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, nope. Romans, <laughs> Romans got there first. Yeah, somehow or other. <laughs> okay, uh, going back to uh, Greeks for a second. Um, we have a question huh? from uh, Thomas. Huh? Uh, Gre uh, Greek uh, citizens of one state they tended to uh, not like Greek, Greek citizens of other states very much. Mm -hmm. But they uh, kind of were uh, very happy to tutor Romans and uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. how, how did that work out? Uh, why, why did that happen? Oh, when the Greeks start becoming kind of friends to the Romans? Um, well, um, so, so for the first point, right, the Greeks each had their own city, you know, their own little city-state, their polis. Um, and they were fiercely jealous of their polis. You know, that, that was their hometown. And, you know, they would fight for their polis. They would die for their polis. Um, and so all of these kind of petty rivalries between these very small cities, you know, only a couple miles apart in some cases, but they're, you know, fighting, you know, these little, little bitty battles. Um, so after um, Alexander the Great um, conquers Greece, effectively, or rather his father, Father Philip does, um, these cities become parts of larger kingdoms. So those old rivalries kind of fade away. Um, people are going to think of themselves more as Greeks in general than as just a citizen of Athens or of Megara. Um, and more importantly, once the Romans conquer all of Greece, which happens in the course of the second century BC, um, there, there's really no point in these old struggles anymore. Rome has won. You know, Rome, Rome's not going anywhere. And so they kind of say, okay, well, if you can't beat them, join them. 
And, you know, many are taken as slaves initially. Um, so when the Romans first come through, uh, they enslave hundreds of thousands of people in Greece. And the more educated Greeks um, can get their freedom often by, you know, saying, telling the, telling the guy who was trying to sell them at the slave market, hey, you know, I can teach Greek grammar, knowing that some senator will say, hey, I want you to teach my son Greek grammar. And so they, they become tutors to young Romans by being slaves in some cases. But in general, um, because Greek civilization is so prestigious in Rome, there's a constant demand um, for high-end tutors, um, for the sons of the elite, um, and even for the young men who want to learn how to, sp how to uh, speak well. Uh, and so just the, the educational prestige of Greek civilization means there's a constant demand. And these guys pay pretty well if you're not a slave. Uh, and so there's this uh, that keeps Greeks coming in from all corners of the Eastern Empire. Uh, the Roman satirist Juvenal, uh, who has nothing good to say about Greeks in general, um, has this long passage about, you know, he complains about the Greeks coming in from all over the place, from Syria, from Greece, from Egypt. <laughs> um, and all these Greeks know that they can get good money if they become a tutor to some wealthy Roman, uh, brother to his sons. Um, even, the, even the emperors will have these Greek uh, philosophers or, or rhetoricians tutoring their sons and grandchildren. Um, and so it begins, right, as slaves who are brought in, you know, from the East. But after that initial initial phase, it's free Greeks who know that the most money is to be made by going to Rome and becoming a tutor. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, just follow the money. Yeah, yeah exactly, right? <laughs> Always. <laughs> and uh, that brings me to, brings me to another question. Uh, when you have uh, Roman and Greek rhetoric or uh, Roman and Greek uh, theater or writing, are there some kind of distinguishing characteristics or did uh, one eventually just flow into the other and uh, become the same? Yeah, so the, the Romans, as I mentioned before, really copy many aspects of Greek civilization because at the time when they're just becoming an important power, they discover a culture that's already mature. It's been around for many centuries and has a well-established literature and you know famous authors. And so things like Roman epic, like Virgil and his Aeneid, are modeled directly on Homer's Iliad. You know, very and, and the Odyssey too. Um, you know, they're actually meant to be rivals to those Greek works because they know everyone who's reading this learned the Greek stuff too because they're Romans. And they have this bilingual education. Um, in most cases, the Romans most. Roman poetry grows up in the under the influence of Greek poetry. Um, Roman drama is a literal direct translation in some cases of Greek comedy and Greek tragedy. They, they were original later on. But the Romans are original in some respects. Um, so like satire, that's a purely Roman form. Um, the idea of, you know, so of course the Greeks talked crap about their, you know, their people, their leaders too. But the Romans make an art form out of it. So satire was a Roman thing. Um, and, and they adapt their Greek models in some creative ways as well. Um, but but really, um, when it comes to the basics of how they think about everything from poetry to drama to even history, um, the Greeks come first and the Romans imitate those models. They, they make them their own, but the origins are in Greek civilization. Yeah, I, I still find it amazing to think of the concept of inventing something like satire because it's... Um... Mm -hmm. Right, so natural, right? Yeah, it's just kind of so deeply embedded in, uh, yeah. in our culture that you think it's uh, right, right. something natural. <laughs> yeah, right, you'd have to invent it, right? You just find it oh, there. Yeah, I guess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess there was someone was the first, this first smartass, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we have another question from uh, T. With Tyler. What is your favorite Roman era invention? Innovation? Invention, invention um, yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. You know, I, I would say for just sheer aesthetics, um, Roman blown glass is my favorite. So the, the Romans, you know, so glass has been around for a long time, but it's in the Roman era, uh, sometime in the first century AD, and probably in the East, um, really in Syria, that the people start blowing glass for the first time. And they, um, within a century, have this, this wonderfully innovative approach to glass work. So these very beautiful glassware, you know, the, the different colors of glass woven into it, um, these elaborate jars and stuff. Um, so there are much more important Roman inventions like, you know, concrete, for example, which is the one that matters the most in terms of architecture. Um, or there's things like this, uh, there's even like a primitive Roman threshing machine, um, which is much more important in terms of history of technology. But I think for just sheer aesthetics, I, I kind of like Roman glassware, so that they invented, or at least that they're, the provincials invented, and is this, this important, you know, addition to uh, craft work? 
When was glass? When did glass start being used? I mean, was, uh, I know we talk a lot about pottery and pottery shards and so on, but uh, I guess I'm guessing that uh, gl glass blowing, sorry, glass uh, glass work is a much more recent uh, uh, invention. You know, I actually don't know when glass was first used, like on a larger scale. Of course, people knew about it. You know, that like, like lightning hits a beach, you know, and they find the natural glass blown up from there, or like you know, they build a fire on top of a sand beach, and the fire melts some of the sand. Um, you know, it comes from the Near East. I think from Egypt and Syria, there's a very long tradition of glass that was not blown; it was like laid, like dribbled over a form. But I, I couldn't tell you when that was started. Uh, I, actually, not, I'm not sure. I'm sure you're going to say I'm going to go online and find this out, but you know, it's <laughs> actually not, not possible. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, jumping on to uh, something else, going back to uh, Colosseums, mm -hmm. because I guess mm -hmm. most of the exposure we get to uh, Roman and Greek cultures through uh, television and films and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a question from Charlene. Uh, considering all the TV shows about Romans, which one do you think, uh, from those you've seen, is uh, the most historically accurate? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's interesting with historical accuracy. You know, there, there most things right are, are, are way off. You know, nothing to do almost <laughs> what actually happened, and that's fine. You know, but like there are times when I don't actually mind historical historical inaccuracy, like like the movie Gladiator with Russell Crowe. You know, that was just uh, it's not accurate at all. Um, you know, it, according to that movie, um, you know, Commodus kills Marcus Aurelius, which did not happen, uh, tries to marry his sister, did not happen, and then is then killed by a random gladiator in the Colosseum, which definitely didn't happen. <laughs> but the movie is so well done. It's so entertaining, and it kind of captures the, the flavor of ancient Rome. I don't mind it. Um, in terms of most accurate, I think that um, there's an HBO series, Rome, about 15 years ago. Uh, they did a pretty good job. It follows um, the, the death of Caesar, the rise of Augustus, um, pretty much, you know, the, the years of the, the end of the Republic and the beginning of the New Roman Empire. Um, that was well acted. And again, the, they had a lot of uh, consultants on the show who were Roman historians. And it shows in the details. So, like the city of Rome looks like Rome probably actually did look. It was kind of grimy. It's kind of dirty. It's not all just, you know, these polished marble colonnades. <laughs> um, there's graffiti on the walls, which was kind of like Pompeii graffiti. Um, and so I think that show, HBO's Rome, the best job of capturing the atmosphere of ancient Rome. I know that in your book you have a chapter on the uh, common housing rather than the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the big marble public buildings. Right, and, right. Uh, yeah. It does give a very different flavor of uh, mm -hmm. uh, what what the city of Rome would have looked like. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's kind of like uh, you think almost like like 19th century new york or something or like uh, you know pre victorian london you know it's kind of a big messy you know loud city um that it, it works you know and people seem to make it make it happen but it's not a nice place to live and we shouldn't imagine it all being this you know beautiful you know glowing marble yeah, that's uh, the analogy made with uh, victorian london or uh, early new york is pretty much the <laughs> impression i got from uh, from the book mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a rough place to live, but uh, you know, probably never, never boring, whatever else it was. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I think you also also mentioned in your book that there was a lot of uh, street violence, mostly uh, robbers and so on. Yes, um, you know, it was worst we think um, during the late Republic. You know, when order breaks down in Rome, you know, so that the government falls to pieces for about really twenty years in the middle of the first century BC. Uh, and during that time, apparently there actually there are, there are guilds of criminals that grow up, almost like modern mobs, like the mafia in America. And there's organized crime in Rome that becomes a big problem. Um, when Augustus comes to power, he apparently stamps all this down. But uh, Rome was very dangerous at night. You know, almost no one went out because there was no street lighting, and so you know, no one went out at night if they could avoid it, um, because there was a good chance you'd just be you'd be mugged, you'd be robbed in the street, and possibly killed. There are tombstones are outside Rome, a whole bunch of them which add the line killed by robbers or killed by thieves, you know, and uh, so yeah, it was not a safe place. You know, we, we can't estimate, you know, the, the murder rate or anything, but um, it was probably more dangerous than almost any modern city just because there was, it wasn't really, there was no police, there was no regulation. Um, and so, you know, the emperor himself had his guard of praetorians and there was the people who kept the fire, who, the fire watch basically. 
But besides that, you know, you're on your own at night, and yeah. uh, good luck. Yeah. yeah, from what I could, from what I could understand, the Firewatch was uh, operated pretty much on the mafia rules anyway. So exactly, Ryan. Right. <laughs> so, is that a fire now? Probably not. And they would, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty haphazard. Uh, mm. How how was that compared to uh, Greek cities? Uh, did they also have the same problem with uh, uh, with street crime and uh, mm -hmm. violence at night and so on? As far as we can tell, you know, the thing is that Rome is so much bigger than any other place in the ancient world. You know, Rome has, we think about a million people for maybe 300 years, and no other city even approaches that in the ancient world. Um, Alexandria may have had a half million for a while. Um, you know, Antioch and Ephesus may have had, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand. But most cities are tiny. You're talking between 5,000 and maybe 15,000 people, and that's it, the size of a modern town. And so, yeah, there, there's crime, certainly, but they're so much smaller that Rome's problems seem pretty unique because so few cities have just that scale, you know, that number of people packed so closely together. You know, Rome has these big, these insulae, these apartment buildings, and those are almost unique. There, there, there are other examples elsewhere, excuse me, elsewhere in the Roman world, but they're much, much smaller. Um, you know, for, for Rome, it's just, uh, it plays by its own rules, really. Uh, some cities in the Greek wow. East, Alexandria most famously, um, had a better reputation for managing their, you know, they, they, Alexandria had riots constantly, actually. So they had more urban urban violence than Rome. So they did have cleaner streets. They had these very wide streets with street lighting pretty early okay. on. That was nice. But they also had a very, an incredibly, uh, so that they had, you know, famously three very different populations in Alexandria. There were, you know, there's the Jewish population, the Egyptian population, and the Greek population. And none of them really, really trusted each other. And so there were all these riots um, all the time in Alexandria, um, despite having these you know, well-run you know, cities and you know, the streets with no, no trash and anything else. So I think any big city in the ancient world just had problems. Antioch, um, Constantinople had terrible riots. You know, it's just, uh, unless you have a big group of troops, party of troops in a city, you can't really keep order um, without having an established police force when things go wrong. And that is kind of shown again and again in ancient history. Yeah, I mean, riots seem to be a recurring theme uh, pretty much everywhere, everywhere in, uh, in the Roman period. <laughs> yeah, sadly. <laughs> okay, we have a question from uh, Dungeon Matron. Mm -hmm. What laws did Caligula's horse put into action? <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't believe people b believe that is a fact. <laughs> oh, yeah, so that's fun. Yeah, supposedly, well, <clears throat> just to, to elaborate, so there's a legend that Caligula was going to make his horse incitatus into, into the consul. Um, but we think he only joked about this or threatened to do it. He didn't actually make the horse a consul. So sadly, incitatus was not allowed to make any laws. You know, more, more <laughs> is the pity. If I, if I've been a wise politician, we have to assume. But uh, no, he wasn't allowed to, you know, legislate about more stables or better hay, you know, to the best of our knowledge. <laughs> Are there any uh, recurring myths like that, like uh, urban legends, which seem to have mm -hmm. sunk into effect that, that you can recall? Oh, yeah, there are so many urban legends about the Romans. Um, well, even Caligula himself, for example, you know, we, we remember him as being this this maniac. Um, and part of it is that our sources say that he was a maniac, which helps. Um, but, you know, it, it's important with any, even our, our better ancient sources to remember that these authors who are writing you know, at the time that these things are taking place, almost always have a clear reason to want a certain uh, interpretation of events yeah. to become <laughs> known. You know, they're never disinterested. You know, it's like they're writing because the emperor who's hired, you know, who they're writing under killed the guy who they're, you know, smacking down. Um, and so it's always important to think, or like, you know, Nero, for example, you know, Nero fiddling while Rome burned. Of course, there was no fiddles then, you know, they, they been, <laughs> there was no, no violin until, you know, the early modern period. Um, but even that, that Nero, so Nero did, we think, um, supposedly play the liar when Rome was burning, but he didn't burn Rome down, and like, like, like the legend was, to make more room for his palace. It just kind of happened. You know, he was away from Rome at the time, and he was, you know, dragged in, and he did some, you know, <laughs> some unwise uh, grandstanding with his little liar there. But, uh, you know, almost any famous emperor has legends around them that, you know, have become you know, canonical uh, through our movies, you know, or our shows or whatever else, and just, you know, didn't happen that way. Um, e even now, like, like I mentioned, Commodus in the movie Gladiator, people probably think he did do those things because they watched Gladiator 
and yeah. aren't reading, you know, Cassius Dio. Yeah, right. You know, it just it's just more famous. You know, <laughs> more people have seen this stuff, um, for better or worse. And uh, certain notorious figures, people like Nero or Caligula, just attract myths because you know people, you know, want to believe the worst of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, thinking about it, uh, making more stuff up about Nero seems kind of redundant given all the things he we, that that's, that he's documented to have done. Exactly. You don't, you don't have to make stuff up. He's already yeah. ridiculous. He's already a terrible person, you know. But uh, but I think it's kind of like the Chuck Norris jokes that people were making eventually. It just <laughs> exactly, kind of sticks yeah. to the figure. <laughs> right, right. It's a snowball. You know, it just keeps rolling downhill and getting bigger and bigger. And it's like, well, Nero could have done that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sounds like him. Yep, sounds like Nero. Yeah. Okay, and we have another uh, question from Dungeon Maiden. Are togas urban legends? Togas? Yep. Uh, no, no, to togas are a are, are real thing. Um, you know, so the, the toga was an incredibly inconvenient thing to wear. You know, a, a, an unfolded toga is about, uh, oh, about four meters wide and say two meters long, you know, two meters long, um, or, or so the other way around, two meters wide, four meters long. It's a huge, you know, roll of, of wool. And to put it on the right way, you have to have a slave or an attendant help you, you know, kind of drape it over yourself and over and under. And there's no pins in the whole thing. So you have to hold your left arm like this the whole time. And if you don't, if you go like this, it falls off. The whole thing just falls to pieces. So toga is very, very inefficient. Um, but the Romans do wear them. Um, you know, when they have to go to court, for example, um, when they're going for office. Whenever they don't have to, though, they wear tunics, which are much more comfortable. They're just, you know, a much simpler garment you would know, put over your head or something or just wrap around you or fasten with pins. Um, so, so togas, you know, Romans don't wear togas all the time. They only wear them occasionally when they have to. Um, you know, so a toga party, however, is, is a myth. So like, you know, the modern toga party, you know, like a university. <laughs> uh, because when the Romans, when they dine, a toga is so uncomfortable, they don't want to wear togas because, you know, again, you'd be like waddling around with your arm like this the whole time. Um, and so instead they wear something called a synthesis, which is a much more comfortable linen garment. Um, or even silk, if they're daring and very rich, you can afford that silk from China. Um, but uh, yeah, so so togas are real, but toga parties are a myth. Uh, actually, I have a couple of questions about it because uh, first off, the toga sounds a lot like a uh, like a like a flex kind of thing. Because okay, <laughs> yes, I can wear this because I don't need to work like you feel the blubs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned silk, and uh, again, I don't know if this is fact or if just something that I had heard somewhere, but uh, importing silk was one of the uh, things that broke the Roman economy. How much of that is, is true? Uh, so this author, um, Pliny the Elder, talks about how much money the Romans send every year east, um, into India above all. <coughs> um, so most Roman silk, of course, is coming from China, um, but it doesn't come over the Silk Road over land, so that's very expensive. The Parthian Empire, which lies between Rome and China, taxes it very heavily. So to avoid those taxes, the Romans have merchants. That, that, so Romans send ships to India from Alexandria. They go over the Indian Ocean to the west coast of India. And from there, they meet merchants um, who bring silk down from China across the Himalayas into India. Um, and so most Roman silk is coming by the sea uh, into Alexandria. Um, so according to Pliny the Elder, uh, the Romans are spending a gargantuan amount of money every year on this Indian silk trade. And we don't know if he, the number he gives, which I, I forget off the top of my head, it's like 70 million is 30 or something every year. I don't know if that's correct. Um, we don't know if that number is anything like correct, um, but we do have a papyrus. Um, that's the, the receipt pretty much, the customs receipt um, of one ship that came um, from India. And it's filled with spices and a bit of silk. So not, not, not so much of silk, but just kind of Eastern luxuries. And that single ship was worth 10 million is 30, just one ship cargo. So there was a huge amount of silver going east, um, but that didn't break the Roman economy. Um, really what broke it was a combination of things. Um, it was that they kept paying the soldiers more. And you know, at the same time, their mines of gold and silver were, were running dry and the empire was coming under attack on all sides. Uh, and so you know, the economy fell apart because the political system that supported that economy fell apart in the third century um, and never really fully recovered, despite you know the fourth century being kind of a time of, of more uh, more stasis. Um, but so yeah, it, it was um, Eastern luxuries um, were indeed a drain on Roman silver, um, but they didn't break the Romans. It was just you know an outlet for extra Roman, you know, uh, specie. But <clears throat> it's uh, it's making me think because uh, taking the risk of a sea voyage for. Uh... 
mm-hmm. 10 million sesters you would have meant that uh, the yeah. uh, the party in Texas would have been pretty 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 high oh, oh yeah it, 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 they they took in you know like a couple millions of sturdy on taxes alone <sighs> from that ship um which they were happy with of course but yeah tough to be the captain <laughs> Not they had to pay out front or what <laughs> okay so uh Cross from campaign training saying uh, the toga would be half the size of a great kilt. Mm-hmm. But yeah, with a great kilt, you, have, you still have pins and stuff to uh, to help you around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pin, pins are good. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, an incredibly, like you said, it's, it's kind of a flex. It's a way to show that all I have to do right now is hold my toga up. I don't have to, like, you know, hoe a field. You know, th- there are these Roman stories about people, you know, who, you know, are out working in their togas. You couldn't work in a toga. A toga is the most ridiculous thing you could possibly wear while doing anything, you know, physical besides standing up and looking impressive with your, you know, your many folded cloak all around you. Um, and, and there are styles of toga. It's kind of like um, how styles of suit going out of fashion. So they, they, it changes. Like you know, like in the early imperial era, they have a, a much bigger toga, almost like a, with, with more wrappings than normal and these very elaborate pleats. Okay. Uh, later on, kind of a, a waist wrap becomes fashionable. Then there's kind of a slim version in late antiquity. There's the slim toga. Um, so yeah, it's, it is very much like modern fashion in some ways. Yeah, Even it's a very conservative garment. Pe- people are people. Uh, they exactly. just do people things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the toga party, and you reminded me of one of your videos, the one where you do uh, Greek drinking games. Or from this, oh, uh, okay. for this uh, Greek drinking games from the uh, oh, yes, uh, symposia. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do Romans have anything like that, or were, or were the nurse more uh, by the first? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the Romans, as so often, did copy Greek drinking games to some degree too. Um, though they, we know some Roman drinking games. They're all they're all kind of boring to be honest. They're kind of lame. Um, so the Romans, there, there was one where you, you had to uh, drink as many cups of wine as the number of letters in your host's name. And most Romans have three or four names. That means, you know, <laughs> 20 or 25 letters. And so that means that they're just taking, you know, endless cups of wine. Um, or they, you know, there's things like whether they're like, uh, they'll gamble. And, you know, the guy who loses the bet has to drink a whole bunch of wine. Um, you know, so that they, they had their drinking games, um, but they, they weren't terribly exciting. This kind of got really drunk <laughs> really quickly. Yeah, that, that seems to have been the point, it uh, sounds like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, at that point, it's like, okay, yeah, you're just going to drink 20 cups of wine. Uh, yeah, tough go of it. Um, the, the Romans, so the Greeks um, famously had these symposia where you'd have a food course first, and then the drinking course came afterward. The Romans had these very, very long banquets where, the, where food and wine are served together. And so they stretch them out over days sometimes. We hear about um, one that lasted three entire days. It's a three-day long party. Just three-day um, long, just eating and drinking, it's like... Yeah, they must have like been sleeping at some point in there, you know, like nap at some point. But uh, but yeah, just like a, a three day long, just continuous party. So by the end of that, I mean, everyone must have been out of their mind. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they they were committed. Was was the wine uh, around the time lower in alcohol content, higher? Uh, actually, higher. We think um, because um, the, the Romans and Greeks um, tended to harvest their grapes. Um, just at the point when the grapes are totally ripe. And now we tend to harvest them a little bit earlier. And so when grapes are totally ripe, it's in their alcohol content, their sugar content rather, it's highest. And that sugar becomes alcohol when it ferments. Um, However, the wine is served um, cut with water. Um, They mix it with water. And so it's probably about the strength of modern beer, we think. You know, where where like an average modern wine is probably about 12% alcohol by volume. And the average modern beer is about 4%. Um, Probably the average Roman wine, because it's cut with, with water, is something like you know five or four percent um, alcohol, so it's not that strong because they're mixing it with so much water. Um, but they do drink so much of it that they compensate, probably. <laughs> yeah, it would adapt eventually. Exactly right. Yeah, uh, was it a, a Spartan king? I remember correctly, had been uh, like uh, in a boat as an al- kind of an alcoholic because he used to drink the water. Uh, ah, sorry, the wine uh, uncut. Oh yes. I think they mentioned it was the, uh, in the Persian way or something like that. Yes, yes. So the good memory. Yes, there was one Spartan king who became notorious for adopting Eastern ways, and uh, he became known as an alcoholic um, who would drink wine the barbarian way, which is right, just uncut wine. Um, and so yeah, they, they called it um, Scythian style, uh, Scythian style. The Scythians are these barbarians who live in what's now Ukraine, more or less. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so to drink it Scythian style was to drink it straight up, pure. And that was a mark of barbarians, Easterners, or drunks. Um, so you, you don't want to be the guy who's known to be the, the straight wine drinker. Uh, the, the, the Romans later on, so they, they did cut the wine with water the way the Greeks did, but it became more acceptable later to drink wine just straight. Um, I don't know if the wine got better or what it was, but uh, you know that, that became uh, more of a custom later. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, I do have, have a few questions about uh, animals in the arena. Again, uh -huh. I know you've got a chapter about uh, how they uh, source those animals in your book. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of uh, the animal training, they, the animals go to any particular training for the ring or sorry, sorry for the for the arena, or, and were there specialists for that to to train them? Mm -hmm. So there actually were, we think, yes, that there was a sort of a zoo in Rome um, outside the city walls, a place where they kept the animals before the games. Um, so often for a big celebration, this would begin years before the, the, all the hunting process, that they begin getting bears from Germany, um, getting lions, from North Africa, um, even tigers um, from India. It was a really important game. Um, and so all these animals, when they come into Rome, um, in those months between when they arrive in Rome and when they appear in the arena, are held in this primitive zoo um, with you know pits and cages. And actually people come to see them sometimes, it's almost like a modern zoo, but they're trained. Um, so, so carnivores, most carnivores, you know, bears and lions and you know, leopards, whatever else, are not naturally aggressive towards people. They tend to kind of shy away from people unless they're very hungry. And so they actually train animals to become more fierce, that they pick the ones that are the most savage um, and actually train them to be less afraid of people, um, probably by, you know, throwing slaves at them basically. But, um, you know, the, the idea is uh, that, you know, these animals that come in, you know, to the arena, the ones that are going to attack prisoners um, are half starved. They're very, very hungry. And often they've been trained for months to be less afraid of humans. Um, so we don't know a lot about how that works, but there actually are animal trainers whose whole job um, is to keep these, get these animals ready um, for their showing in the arena. So again, we're saying it's not an animal in its natural state. It was really prepared to... Uh, it had exactly, to be prepared yeah. To that, yeah. Right, it was, it was a trained animal. Mm -hmm. And w were they only used on prisoners or... Uh, and only animals only were, uh, were only used on, on prisoners or how did that work? Uh, yeah, so so animals, you know, of course, are used in many ways in the arena. You know, a few lucky animals are just displayed. They're just, you know, if they're very rare, like a giraffe, for example. Giraffes are so uncommon that when they come to Rome, they're just displayed. Um, so Caesar gets the giraffe somehow or other from Southern Africa, um, and he, and it's just Caesar's giraffe. He just shows it off whenever he can because this very crazy, this strange animal that he can show off whenever you know whenever when people are gathered together. But more common animals, things like bears, which are pretty common, um, or, or lions. Which used to be a lot more common than they are now. There are lions in all across North Africa and even in parts of uh, as far east as far west as Greece for a while. Um, so animals like that um, are used both in beast hunts, where they're mowed down by specialists, either in archery, you know, who can shoot them down, um, or guys with just you know, you know, a sword. There's actually one guy who specializes in just choking out animals. He doesn't use weapons. He just, with his bare hands, will like choke out a bear or a lion. Um, uh, so yeah, they're, they're called, um, you know, the, the venatores, um, the, these hunters, you know, who are trained to kill or at least disable animals, um, either with their bare hands like that, you know, maniac, um, or in most cases with, with weapons. Um, so Emperor Commodus um, was known to be a very good shot with the bow and he would, you know, mow down hundreds of animals, um, you know, from special platforms in the Colosseum. So they're used for that, but that's what their main purpose in the, in, in the arena is to be um, displayed in these hunts. But they're also, right, used against prisoners. Um, so kind of the, the, the halftime show, notoriously, in Roman games um, is where condemned prisoners are fed to the beasts. And, uh, you know, this can take a lot of forms, but typically they're tied to stakes and the animals, which are half starved, are unleashed on them. It doesn't always work. Often the animals still don't don't kind of just leave them alone and be kind of driven toward them, or they just kill their prisoners with arrows or something. Um, but uh, but yeah, so the animals have different uses. But it, it is just a way for the emperor to show um, it was, it's entertainment, you know, for the people. You know, much of it seems us kind of you know so barbaric, but it's a way for the emperor to show how far his power reaches. That I can bring animals from the ends of the earth for your entertainment. 
Is it also like a, <clears throat> like a control thing? Like, uh, look, we have also uh, control over nature and that kind of thing? Exactly, yes. It's, it's a way of showing how even the power of nature is subject to the emperor's authority. Um, yeah, so it is. It, it has a lot of symbolic aspects to it. You know, bring these animals. It, it, it's a hugely expensive uh, process. You know, they, they try to reduce costs by making soldiers do it, you know, off duty, off duty soldiers. So there's a guy in Germany, or a couple guys in Germany, who become bear specialists. And their whole thing in winter, when there's nothing else to do, is to go out into the woods and get find bears and bring them to, you know, bring them back for, you know, to Rome for the arenas. Um, you know, there are specialized, um, we hear about a whole troop of soldiers in what's now Tunisia, whose job is to net antelope, you know, just to kind of hunt down antelope and bring them back, you know, for, for the arena. Um, and there are also, also specialized beast hunters whose whole thing, you know, whose job is to be bounty hunters pretty much for animals. Um, but even so, it, it's a hugely expensive process, bringing these animals to the Colosseum, keeping them there. Because once you bring them to the Colosseum, they, they die in a single day, almost all these animals. So they don't keep them around. They're, there's a one-time deal. Um, and so it only makes sense for the emperors to do this um, if there's a real political payout. And that seems to be in this, this symbolic aspect that, you know, I control nature um, by displaying these, you know, strange and exotic animals for you. I mean, that, that payoff must have been uh, really good because uh, they just kept yeah, right. throwing this money at it. it right, yeah. It's, it's a very, uh, you know, it, it was a very finite, a finite resource. They, but they, they wiped out the lions in many parts of North Africa. Um, they, they just, just them? I mean, just this process? Just this process, yeah. They, they, they actually uh, made extinct a kind of elephant. There's, there's these pygmy elephants in North Africa that the Romans apparently either hunted to extinction or just drove to extinction. Um, and so the, the, there's quite a bit of, the, of ecological damage the Romans do, um, besides, of course, the terrible things to people who are, you know, <laughs> exposed to the animals um, in the process of gathering all these creatures. So the, 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 that's actually uh, pretty terrifying. I mean, uh, I, I thought they were, like, uh, became extinct over time due to the, the change in the area, but to have them... Uh, yeah. And again, the time period we're talking about is not very long. It's like uh... no, yeah, a couple, yeah, a couple centuries really. But yeah, like you said, people, people are people, and uh, we don't have a very good sense of how to use resources sometimes. And that's <laughs> yeah, a that, good that, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Martin from Palpatelli is asking. You mentioned the emperor a lot regarding the arena. Has there been a Republic era arena culture as well? Yes, um, it really emerges from the Republic, um, from the very. So before the emperors, um, you know, there, there's this, this highly competitive system in, in place in Rome where members of a few elite families are competing to become the top politicians, to become the consuls, the, the praetors, uh, the generals, you name it. Um, and a big part of how you become a top politician in Rome is by displaying your wealth and your concern for the people. And that often involves these games. So, you know, like the gladiators evolved supposedly from funerary games given by the Etruscans uh, long before the Romans. But it's really a Roman thing. And it's totally about um, important, ambitious politicians who want to make a big show for the people. And so the first animals imported um, are not by the emperors. It's by these politicians who are trying to put on a good show for the voters and therefore, you know, become, you know, a known name. Like, oh, yeah, you know, Gaius, he's going to burn all those leopards last year. Um, and so you know, they'll spend huge amounts of money, go deeply into debt, just getting animals. Like, like Cicero, um, who's a, a governor for a while and what's now Turkey, um, is pestered by one of his friends to bring leopards. You know, like, the guy just keeps like, Cicero, hey, where's my leopards, man? Uh, because he just wants leopards for the games he wants to give the next year. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it was a culture in place before the emperor showed up. You know, most of our arenas are later uh, from the imperial era because um, – so most of our architecture in Roman cities, there's more money than um, more resources for very large, impressive buildings. But uh, the arena in Pompeii, for example, dates to about 80 BC, you know, long before um, the time of Caesar or Augustus. Uh, am I correct in understanding that uh, horse racing was uh, more popular than, uh, sorry, chariot racing was more popular than uh, glad gladiatorial fights, at least in uh, mm -hmm. everyday terms? Yes, yeah, it, it was the most popular sport uh, because, you know, again, you know, it, it's very, to throw games at the Colosseum is hugely expensive and you can't do it very often. So, you know, the animals are hard to get and they're expensive 
And gladiators are also very expensive. You have to hire gladiators, they, or you have to you have to rent them. Really, you rent them from the schools, um, which you know own them because they're they're almost always slaves. Um, and so to, to rent your, your gladiators to get your animals in, you can't do it very often. And once you do, you know you, you kill them all in a day. You know, or the gladiators you kill a lot of them and you can't use them again. Um, but chariot racing, um, you can do again and again with the same people. You can have superstars you know, who race the same teams. And so, yes, uh, in Rome, famously, so there's you know, the Colosseum, which can seat, we think, somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people. And then the Circus Maximus, which is where chariot races happen, has something like 200,000 seats. It's enormous. It's, you know, it's, this, it's the, the, the Talladega Super Speedway, you know, here in the U.S. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, you know, these enormous stadiums. Um, and, and yeah, so races are held uh, hundreds of times a year. You know, there are many, many races. And uh, it is, again, kind of like, well, like, you know, like like Formula One or NASCAR, where there are teams, you know, there are four factions in Rome, um, each named for a color. Um, and uh, these factions have their own drivers who become very famous in their own right. And they'll race, um, in some cases, multiple times every in, in a single day. There will often be 10, 10 races or more, or actually like 24 races in a day becomes the standard program on a race day. Um, and um, yeah, you know, people will come in, you know, there's huge amounts of betting around, you know, the, these races, um, there's really, really a whole subculture that there's one uh, historian from the fourth century who complains about that. The people in Rome talk about nothing else besides racing. That's it. <laughs> they talk about racing, you know, and um, yeah, it just becomes kind of like our modern sports, you know, all of our sports rolled into one. <clears throat> so, so, excuse me. Uh... <clears throat> So racing wasn't uh, an event-based thing like, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, I conquered this province, so I'm going to throw some games, mm -hmm. uh, but it's rather like a, more like a commercial uh, thing where it's done exactly. on a... All right. Yeah, yeah, because of course games are given almost always by the emperors, at least in Rome, and outside Rome by wealthy people who want to make a splash, who want, want to make a big show. And, you know, again, because they're so expensive, you only do it occasionally, like you said, to celebrate, you know, the, a conquest or an important achievement or an anniversary. But the game, the, the, the races are not run by the emperors. They're run privately by these factions, these companies who make a huge amount of money, um, you know, with That's, the emperors. So, so it is a private, private uh, enterprise kind of thing. Mm -hmm, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, circling back to the arena for a second. Uh, question from Ertman Brick. Were animals in the arena really trained to uh, copulate people to death? So, so yes, um, th th there's um, a couple of notorious episodes where th this may have occurred. Um, we don't know, and it's you know, a, it kind of, it's kind of a horrifying thing to think about. Yeah. But uh, our two bits of evidence. So th there's one. There's a Roman novel called uh, the, the Golden Ass or the Metamorphosis, which uh, in which the main character Lucius is turned into a donkey. Um, and it's a donkey for most of the novel. And then he's turned back into a person um, with the help of the goddess Isis. It's, it's kind of a strange book. Um, but at one point, um, Lucius, the donkey, um, is brought into arena um, where he's going to be part of a show in which he's supposed to uh, make love to a woman. It never actually happens. And this is a novel that's satirical, um, but this is apparently is, is, can be contemplated by at least the readership of this novel. There's also a poem uh, by Marshall um, from the first century in which it describes um, a reenactment of the myth of Pasiphae. Uh, so Pasiphae was the wife of King Minos of Crete. Um, and because Minos uh, decided to, uh, well, he kind of snubbed one of the gods, the gods, with their typical divine uh, vindictiveness, made his wife fall in love with a bull. Um, his wife passed the fell in love with the bull, and uh, she got it on with the bull, and that's where the Minotaur comes from. You know, the Minotaur, of course, half bull, half man. And so supposedly this myth was reenacted, the myth of Pasiphae was reenacted with a live woman sending in for Pasiphae and an actual bull. Um, we don't know if this ever actually happened or how it would have been managed, but if it did happen, it would have been fatal for the woman because it's, you know, a bull weighs, you know, almost a ton um, in some cases, and it would have been, you know, a horrifying thing. But um Again, we don't know if it happened. If it did, it was very uncommon. And it might have been kind of like the like a, the, the, the Tijuana donkey show, <laughs> where it's one of these things that, that becomes part of pop culture that people talk about, but probably didn't really happen. It doesn't happen, you know, routinely. Uh, again, I, I don't, we don't know. 
Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, it, uh, it might be kind of uh, like if someone found the, uh, a copy of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in uh, 3,000 right, right. years and it thought, oh, this must have been mm. happened very frequently. Right, right. Although those poor teenagers, <laughs> and they just go <laughs> down. Uh, exactly, same deal. We, we don't know if we're dealing with, you know, satire, exaggeration, or just we're misinterpreting things. Okay, moving on to uh, another environment completely. Uh, catacombs? <laughs> catacombs? Catacombs, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think you did a couple of videos about the uh, catacombs of Rome and the uh, Roman underground in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already an amazing uh, mega dungeon kind of thing. Uh, so Oh, it really is. Yeah, just the, the sheer scale of the catacombs. You know, I've, I've read before that if you stretch out the catacombs of Rome into a straight line, they'd be longer than Italy itself. You know, they, they'd be more than four to miles long, which is, is pretty impressive. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because there's a lot of tunnels and levels and... Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. And are those, were those purely uh, created as burial grounds or was it uh, burial and uh, storage and other stuff and then they just kind of ran into each other eventually? So they were built initially just as burial places. Um, you know, and actually they weren't even... So as I mentioned in my video on this, there's this idea, kind of a pop, pop culture myth, that they were made, that the Christians would hide in them in the persecutions. And that's not true because they're very obvious. You know, they have these big entrances. You know, if you want to hide, it's a terrible <laughs> place to hide. Um, and, and so they're really just for, they're, they're cheap places to bury um, people. You know, it, it becomes very hard in Roman history to find a cheap burying place because there's so many people in Rome, they all die eventually. And so, and they're all buried along the main roads outside the city, along the highways. And those get built up very thickly and become very expensive to find new plots for burial. And so someone has the bright idea that Rome sits on top of this uh, volcanic rock that's very soft. You can cut tunnels into it without working too hard. Um, and even better, once, once this, this rock is exposed to the air, it hardens. And so it's the perfect way um, to just tunnel into this stuff and build um, new subterranean cemeteries. And those are the catacombs. They become uh, linked with uh, first the Jews and then the Christians because those people, those communities use them most often. Um, but there are pagans buried down there as well. Uh, and so initially they're just cheap burial grounds. Um, but later on, um, when they become linked with the Christian martyrs, people begin to hold um, masses down there, feasts. They begin to have celebrations down in the catacombs to celebrate the people who were, were buried there long before. Yeah, actually, uh, my girlfriend and I had a question about it because uh, mm -hmm. we visited some uh, catacombs locally uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh -huh. and one of the uh, things that the guide was talking about were uh, funerary feasts held uh, right next to the uh, newly deceased, newly buried. Mm -hmm. Like, within that kind of smell a bit, <laughs> how, how did that work? Uh, oh, yeah, so... so... It would have, yeah, the smell would have been horrifying when, they, when these things are being used. I mean, because they weren't sealed really. So, how it would work is you would, you would lay a body, um, they're, they're, they're called locally, the niches in which you lie a body. And they're about, you know, about six feet long, as long as a person, about as wide as a person, and maybe, uh, I don't know, two feet, you know, say a half meter high. Um, and that's sealed with um, often either stone or uh, terracotta slabs, and it's kind of mortared in. And they would leave, um, bottles of oil inside to try and cut the smell a bit. Um, but it didn't really work because again, you know, it, it's a rotting body inside this, this, this closed space. And so, you know, there, there are these, um, they build these ventilation ducts into the catacombs, these kind of, they cut all the way down from the ground level, um, down to the lowest level to try and funnel some of that air out. But it would have been pretty, pretty terrifying, uh, even despite, you know, all those oils, those vials of oil. Um, it's not so bad because by the time they're holding feast on the catacombs, that's a hundred years afterward. So all the bodies have decomposed already. Um, so there, there's some people who died a long time ago and all of the bodies in the catacombs around them, you know, that was all, they're all buried long before. Um, but there were some, there would have been some fresh ones and they just kind of would have had to deal with it, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, it would have been pleasant for you or me to do it, but I guess oh, they yeah, were, for sure. yeah, more tuned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the thing was that this guy was explaining it like, uh, they just, you know, put the body in, close it up, have a feast. So Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, you know. It, it would have been much better to have the feast, you know, up above. So, you know, the, the Romans have this culture. Um, they have a couple um, holidays, kind of like the Mexican Day of the Dead, where they celebrate, um, you know, dead relatives with, with a feast at the gravesite. 
And this makes plenty of sense if they're buried above ground. You can go out to the cemetery, you know, have a picnic there. Um, the Greeks actually will the pour libations, you know, a, a liquid sacrifice. They often have like a little tube actually built into the grave. So you're going to pour it right down into the grave. Ah, um, so it's not know. just, you know, pouring one out for, uh, right, for the dead homie. Exactly. It's a, literally right, right. The home, to the dead homie. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the dead homie's right there. He's getting it straight <laughs> up. Uh, and, uh, and so it makes plenty of sense, right, to have these feasts, you know, when it's a nice sunny day, you know, you're out, out having a picnic. Down in the catacombs, it's less pleasant because you're in this, you know, very narrow corridor, but the, really the only the, the width of the man, a man's shoulders, basically, um, ringed by these reeking graves. Um, and so, yeah, if they had them down there before the feast for the martyrs, they must have been above, you would think. I mean, the, the, the reason they say that is that they find the remains of uh, broken pots and stuff, you know, remains of, of stuff used for meals in the catacombs. And so they assume that people were eating down there, but I think that happened long afterward, you know, when, when they're celebrating the martyrs who were buried there long before, and that the families of the people who were buried there would have their celebrations up above, I would imagine. Yeah, Otherwise, it would have been unbearable. Yeah, yeah, I, I would sense. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, going into these uh, tunnels and stuff, what would have they used for uh, for lighting, I mean? Was, again, in movies and stuff, you see the guys with the torches and... The torch, uh... yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it was less dramatic. They would use an oil lamp. Um, so they just have a lamp full of olive oil, and it would have a, you know, a spout on one side, and the spout would be lit. Um, they, they find thousands of those things down in the catacombs, um, where people dropped them, you know, or just, you know, they, they ran out of oil and smashed it against the floor or something. Um, but yeah, so they, they would have used those. You know, there were those light shafts here and there, the ventilation shafts, but it, wouldn't, it was very dark. Um, and some of the biggest catacombs had, you know, endless tunnels with no shafts. And so without those lights uh, you were lost and there's a famous story about um was it antonio bosio he was one of the first explorers of the catacombs and got lost and was stuck there for two days couldn't find his way out for two days he was groping among the bones and the broken you know uh pottery shards trying to find his way out and finally saw a glimmer of light in the distance and you know that was his way his way he found his way out that way but uh you know kind of a horrifying way to go and you know that that, that could have happened easily if you were down there alone and didn't have a lamp yeah, uh, I, I think there were accounts from the catacombs of Paris, which uh, differs yeah. entirely. But again, uh, same thing happened, except that the uh, people involved were only found about five, six yeah. years later when it was uh, way too late for them. Oh, yeah, right. Jeez. Um. <laughs> uh, Cross says, pour one out for my roomies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, stuff and would the same uh, lanterns would, would, uh, have been used to travel around at night, assuming that you wanted to go at night? Uh, yes. I mean, so, torches, you know, are are great and everything, and they're used sometimes. So like, like once, um, Caesar has a very elaborate triumph, which involves elephants holding torches in their trunks. Um, the kind of that they're sitting on either side of the road, you know, they're, like, they're pretty much living light poles with these giant torches, um, which is cool if you're Caesar, but if you're an ordinary person, torches yeah. are very... It, yeah, you know, even, it's, it's, even without the elephant, yeah. <laughs> even without the elephant, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so usually oil lamps are the standard way, standard mode of illumination in the ancient world. Um, you know, their olive oil can be kind of expensive, so they aren't used constantly. Um, we think that typically after it got dark, people just went to bed pretty much because you can't really read or write easily by oil lamp light. So you have a whole bunch of them. You know, a single oil lamp does not throw very much light, and it's uh, you're, you're squinting, you're bent over your work. Um, and so you can have mul they had candles too, um, you know, wax candles, kind of like the Middle Ages did. But um, oil lamps seem to be the more common thing um, they used for illumination. Again, if you're li living in a insula, you don't want to have uh, too <laughs> yes, many open yes. lights going around. <laughs> yeah, seriously, and that, it happens constantly where people, you know, and even worse is cooking because you know they have no fireplaces in these things and so they'll, they'll, they'll bring in um, a brazier just kind of this little this little metal frame like a primitive grill and try to cook food in a brazier but if you knock that over you know all these the charcoal goes down onto the floor and you know the, the whole building goes up um, is, so, yeah, is that why there was, is that why there were so many uh, takeaways and uh, bars and stuff in the room exactly yes because there, there are no kitchens in these apartments uh, except for the very nice ones um, because you know you you it was dangerous to make food up there. Um, and if you did, there was always the risk that you would burn your house down. 
Uh, and so it was just cheaper to have a, you know, a cheap bar, you know, or easier and cheaper to have a bar on the first floor. You would go there, get your meal, and then eat, eat it at home. <laughs> hey, still, I mean, they must have gone through uh, massive amounts of uh, olive oil. Oh, yes. Real... I mean, it, it's, it's, you think about just the, uh, I had a friend in grad school who tried to figure out how the Romans got all the firewood they used uh, to make charcoal and to heat the baths. And uh, he concluded they must have deforested, you know, areas 100 miles around in some cases, because uh, whatever they could bring it down by river, pretty much, because there was so much demand um, for fuel. Um, olive oil, right, is, is a renewable resource, but still, um, you know, we have, um, there, there's a famous um, uh, place called Monte Testacchio um, on the Tiber, which is a giant mound of discarded olive amphorae. Um, so the, the, the Spain was a big source of olive oil, and then, you know, coastal Spain. And so they, they would bring these, you know, huge jugs, you know, these enormous, almost, you know, man-sized jugs of olive oil um, on, off the ships, um, you know, off, off the Tiber. And because olive oil soaks into the, into the clay, you can't reuse those jars. They just smash them on the site in this okay. big mound. And that mound is eventually enormous. It, it became, um, what, uh, I think, uh, you know, 150 feet, 50, 50, 40 or 50 meters high. Um, of just smashed olive amphorae, you know, this huge thing, you know, covering, um, oh, you know, the, the, this huge corner of Rome, basically just a, you know, olive jars. Um, and so again, the, the scale of consumption yeah, in the Roman is, is, is pretty impressive. I mean, the, uh, again, it's like, uh, how, how many people you said that it's height? It's like, uh... Oh, I mean, a million people are in Rome. People, and, I mean, so... and, and that's just the uh, the pottery. I mean, I, I wonder what... Do we find garbage dumps or stuff like that, like uh, tr trash mm. heaps or stuff like that? Well, no, not like a garbage dump, like, like a modern garbage dump, because we think that a lot of stuff is just thrown onto the street, pretty much. It was a very dirty city. And then, <laughs> um, you know, so there, there was a lot of, um, like, animal, you know, animal manure, for example, you know, animal dung, um, for the, you know, transport animals um, from pigs, whatever else. Um, and so all of that stuff was probably scraped off the streets occasionally and used as fertilizer in the fields around. Um, th there were, uh, at one point, discovered a series of uh, pits outside Rome that were used as um, like burial for, burials for the very poor, for example, when other trash was thrown there. Um, that was discovered in the 19th century. But um, in general, there weren't, there weren't true dumps. Things were just kind of hauled out, you know, either thrown in the street or, you know, hauled to the point where they weren't in the way anymore and left there. Um, whenever there's like a new, uh, a low spot has to be filled, for example, they would dump debris in that low spot. Um, and so it's hard to find a big impressive <laughs> dump besides like that mountain of amphorae because, uh, you know, pottery lasts so long. Pottery lasts forever yeah. pretty much. Um, other stuff decays and it's hard, harder to trace. Interesting. Okay, uh a good question from Cross. So uh, Rome had horses, ponies, and donkeys from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I've heard there were breeds bred only in Rome, the city, as well as other Roman reg regions. Is this true? And do these breeds persist today? That's a, that's a good question. Now, I don't know a lot about <laughs> modern horse breeds, to be honest. You know, I, you know, I ride a horse once every three or four years, probably. <laughs> but uh, you know, so the Romans did prefer horses from certain areas. Um, uh, horses uh, from Spain had a very high reputation, for example. Um, so like I know from like the the circus, for example, there were careful lineages kept of the champion horses um, that were used in the races, almost like a modern like, like a Kentucky Derby, for example, like a thoroughbred race, where they had lineages and they would try and breed these horses. Um, and so the emperors had their own stud farms, um, you know, where, that is they bred these very, you know, Moorish horses from North Africa or Spanish horses um, or the big draft horses from Cappadocia and Turkey. Um, and so that there were definitely li horse lineages that were carefully, you know, that they, they were, you know, very jealously watched, you know, that they were, um, they had genealogies, they had lineages, they had stud farms. Um, we don't have any of those records, unfortunately, because they've all perished, um, but they, we know they existed. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know if there were, there were Rome, there were a city of Rome specific, but the legions often had their own stud farms near their legionary bases. And so they'd have you know, like, like a regional stud farm that they would use, you know, for their cavalry. And of course, you know, their cavalry is often um, auxiliaries coming from all over the empire initially, who might bring horses with them. Um, and so there probably was a great deal of mixing of stock, I would think, in many cases. But I, I really don't know if there are any like city of Rome specific breeds. 
though there were some that were used just in the arena, we think, and that were very carefully bred for use in the arena. Or sorry, and by the arena, I mean the circus, of course, the you know, horse is too expensive just to throw away, you know, in a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the, 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 again, uh, goes back to like uh, something like modern Formula One where you've got your mechanics yeah. tinkering with the engines and stuff. Exactly, so, right, right. Except yeah. there you're trying to breed a perfect, uh, perfect race exactly. horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, there, there's even um, some fun. So people who aren't fans of your faction try to curse your horse. They have like like magic spells where they try and yeah, like, a, you know, bury it underneath. That's a fantastic subject. Right, right. They bury it beneath the arena to try and make your horse go lame, you know, or trip at the wrong time. Oh, it's great. It was, yeah. it was very, it was no, no holds barred. Yeah, because I, I think, uh, I, I know you mentioned it in your book and I think you've done a video about them, about care tablets, but I don't recall they were, they were that specific that you would uh, put them in the uh, stables oh, yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> you try and put them where they'll do the most damage. So if, if it's, uh, you put them like right in the starting stalls, um, you know, right where the horse takes off in the arena, in the circus. And I hope that the horse goes lame right there. Um, oh yeah, it, it, it's a it's a whole small industry, pretty much. That takes a lot of dedication to. I mean, uh, I I would imagine mm -hmm. that you would have to sneak inside, then you'd have oh, to uh, yeah. dig a hole in the uh, in the track. Oh yes, yeah, it's, it's commitment. <laughs> I really want that horse to go lame. But if you bet money on the other team, you know, therefore you, you're, you're you're motivated, right? You know? <laughs> So uh, we just mentioned the uh, the legions. Were they mostly <laughs> so the arena horses could only turn left? <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of the uh, the legions, uh, were they uh, mostly uh, recruited from uh, the Rome from how does it uh, Rome the uh, or Italy initially, or were they uh, from all over? Because I know there are auxiliaries who are not Roman citizens, is that correct? Right, that is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so would the others be uh, specifically Roman citizens or they had to be uh, native Romans? How did that, how did that work? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so in theory, every legionary is a citizen when he, be, when he signs up. But in reality, many become citizens when they sign up. If they need, they need men, you know, hey, you're close enough to be a citizen, you're in. Um, but generally, it's citizen men who are signing up for the legions, which means that it tends to be the more Romanized parts of the empire that produce legions, legionaries initially. Mm -hmm. So in the time of Augustus, for example, the time of the civil wars, um, most are coming from Italy itself at that point. Um, above all, northern Italy, for some reason, is uh, a huge factory of legionaries. Um, before that, um, famously, the Romans um, had all these allies all over Italy. And these allies um, who they had conquered, they called them allies, they were just the people they had conquered, um, their tax to Rome was in men, was in legionaries, pretty much, whether legionaries and, and, and allies. So legionaries come from the Roman cities, the allies come from these Italian cities that have been conquered, and they're equipped the same way, pretty much, but it's still an Italian enterprise. Um, so yeah, it remains Italian primarily um, through the reign of Augustus. After that, it becomes much more about Western Europe. Um, so there's many more from Gaul. There's more from Spain. Um, and starting in the late second and third centuries, the center of gravity becomes the frontier zones. Um, so often the, these legionary camps have been established by that point, and they kind of produce their own legionaries at that point, where the sons of soldiers become soldiers in their own right. And uh, the most notorious um, legionary zone are the Balkans in the third century. Um, because so that's a very... It's a heavily militarized zone um, along the, the Danube frontier, especially. Okay. There's not many other good jobs uh, besides the army in that part of the world. Um, and so it becomes um, really a regional industry where a whole series of emperors who come from the ranks of the soldiery are born in the Balkans. Um, and so beginning in Italy, moving to Western Europe, and really ending up above all in the frontier zones in the Balkans is kind of the, the legionary recruitment pattern. But they're coming from all over the empire too. You know, for every, every coin, every province, every every, every part, um, it is those are the centers of gravity: um, Italy, Western Europe, and the Balkans. And uh, the uh, auxiliaries be recruited. I mean, like would, would the centurion or, uh, or an officer say, "Okay, uh, we need some cavalry. We don't have any cavalry. Get get some of the <laughs> uh, local kids." Right, right. I, I mean, we actually don't know. It, it seems to have been voluntary almost always. You know, if people wanted to sign up. Uh, because, you know, it was good wages or pretty good wages, you know, it was a long term job. And uh, again, if you're coming from one of these places that's not very developed in most cases, you know, or a frontier zone, 
there are no better jobs um, than, the, than the military. And uh, it often becomes, as I mentioned before, a family affair um, where soldiers can't marry until uh, legal, legally. You know, the Rand 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 Severus, but they do anyway, that they have these you know, kind of unofficial wives. Now, families who live pretty much in the camps or around the camps, and those kids are raised in the camp, they're going to become soldiers, very likely. Um, and so, right, right. So it becomes a gener generational thing. Okay. And, uh, do I remember correctly that uh, soldiers would be given a plot of land uh, military? Uh, in some cases, um, so they were given either a big discharge bonus, uh, the equivalent of like five years of pay all at once, um, or given a right to choose land in a colony. Um, and so it, it, it varied with the time period and where they were stationed. Um, you know, if they were stationed in, say, North Africa, near where there were a series of settlements in the reign of Trajan, um, it was a good bet. You'd say, I'll get some of this new land by the new city. That'll be my bonus. Um, but in most parts of the empire, there isn't a lot of land to give away um, by the mid-imperial era. And so it becomes much more cash giveaway. It will give you enough land to buy your farm if you want it um, or whatever else you want to do. Um, but that discharge bonus is all you're going to get in cash. Because I was wondering, because uh, like if you said that uh, most of the uh, soldiers at one point came from a particular area, like the Balkans, uh, Mm -hmm. You'd have thought they they would have settled down there eventually, and uh, yeah, right. uh, you know it would have be, become a bit more, uh, more more cities would have developed. You're right, right, and, and many do still in the area. You know, so like they're all, almost always a big legionary fort will have a town that grows up around it. Um, a famous example, of course, is um, is uh, Colonia Colonia Agrippina, which becomes Cologne, you know, or, or Cologne in, in in Germany. All right. Is that how it started? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a legionary fortress that grew up into, you know, a, a full-grown city. Um, Trier, same way, same way. It began as a as a fortress and then kind of snowballed into a city. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's one of the uh, things I found most most fascinating about the uh, Roman legions is in the battles or the equipment. It's their logistics because uh, oh yeah, the scale of them are totally uh, the scale of them is totally mind blowing. Oh, it is incredible. You know, to to have um, a single legion marching, you know, involves something like, you know, 500 draft animals, you know, all those wagons, you know, uh, food for, you know, X number of days. It's, um, it's quite a production. Um, and uh, you really see why the Romans could so outclass their opponents often because they had mastered this long distance logistics. So, uh, came to the production of uh, military equipment, did, did, did they uh, have their own, uh, did the legion have its own uh, factory kind of thing that they carried with them? Mm -hmm. Like their own work. Uh, so, and... you know, it seems to have been surprisingly informal early on. So, like, like gear is actually passed down from so soldier to soldier. We find like three or four different names in the same helmet sometimes. Like one's crossed out, and the next guy gets it. <laughs> right. um, so it's recy it's recycled again and again. Um, so, that, so that they have right that they have their own soldiers who are blacksmiths who can repair armor and make it. But um, troops aren't issued armor; they have to buy it themselves um, with money from their pay. And so it's kind of a, a much resented uh, burden, actually, that they have to buy their own armor. And if, like, you know, their helmet breaks, they got to buy a new one. Um, later in the empire, there will be factories that produce um, this stuff, produce, you know, armor, produce blankets for the soldiers, whatever else. Um, and that seems to have been as close as we got to being truly mass produced goods for the army. Uh, before that, it was apparently uh, pretty much. Um, ad hoc, you know, where, you know, you need a sword, go get a sword from the town, you know, or, or we'll fix your sword here in camp. Um, but it was not just issued to them when they first became a soldier automatically. Okay, so that uh, that image of the, uh, you know, the legion where everyone ex has exactly the same equipment. Exactly. And exactly, that's that's from later on in the, uh, the empire. And that, that's all Hollywood, pretty much. It would have been a much <laughs> more, I mean, so like they had, you know, parade uniforms that were very spectacular sometimes. Um, so we find these helmets as like a, it's like a full metal mask, you know, it's all gilded. It's very elaborate. Um, and so th they had, in some cases, these great dress uniforms. It was white, was the typical dress, you know, uh, parade uniform. So not red um, and uh, stuff. It's a, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so, so red, you know, we, we don't actually know if it was ever the standard color, but white was the ceremonial color they would wear for parade. Um, and that, so that would have been pretty impressive, but in battle, it would have been very patchwork, um, very much, you know, this guy has a dinged helmet, you know, this guy has, you know, a torn cloak. Um, also that was, that was used 
for years and years often and kind of patch to keep it going. So basically a soldier could be wearing his great grandfather's helmet kind of thing. Yeah, as far as we know, um, they, they remain in use for a very long time sometimes. <laughs> and so it, it was not as standardized as you expected to be for a, a military machine that was so efficient. Yeah, but again, I mean, uh, I think their main preoccupation was getting uh, a large number of men to a given place with enough food and uh, drink mm -hmm. to last them through the campaign rather than the minutiae, minutiae of, uh, yep, you have... <laughs> Exactly the length of sword, and you have exactly the length of sword, and so on. Very much so, right? They they figure out the stuff that mattered that they had to that they had to master to make campaign work. Um, but beyond that, right? It was not they didn't have, I guess, the concern or the or the technocracy in effect to make it you know so granular. I mean, I wonder if it's one of the reasons that they were so adaptable. I I think so. Um, you know, that they really could, you know, work either, you know, in the mountains of Armenia or the deserts of Syria, uh, because their whole model expected things to go wrong. It's like, okay, fine, you know, we don't, we can't master this, but we're going to make it work because we're Romans, you know, we're masters of the universe, masters of the world, and that's all that matters. I, I had read somewhere that uh, Romans won uh, campaigns because they could throw more people at a problem than, uh, than other empires and stuff. Is that accurate or uh, what do you think about it? That's true of the Republican period. Um, so at that point, when Rome has um, all of these levies, you know, that they levy their own men from their citizens, and all those allies I mentioned, you know, who are sending them men as a sort of tax, um, Rome has enormous manpower reserves at the time of, say, the war with Hannibal. Um, so, like, you know, any other state at that time would have been just been destroyed by losing 100,000 men. You know, so at K9, they lose 80,000 men, for example. Later, they lose, I think, 40,000. Other cities can't handle losses like that, but the Romans can because they have these, this levy in place where every citizen is, in theory, um, it'll be called up for service. And they have these allies who send them, again, uh, tens of thousands of more men to supply the lack of those who have died. Um, and, and so, yes, in the Republic, Rome has a hugely flexible pool of manpower. They can just throw at almost anything and just kind of outspend uh, their opponents. They can just bleed them to death. Uh, the imperial army is a much more formalized and more expensive affair. Um, so it, it's a lot harder to replace a legion that's destroyed in the empire than it is in the Republic. So when Augustus loses three legions in Germany, famously, you know, when Varus, you know, has the, the, the Tudorberg disaster, um, he's so distressed because training three new legions is a huge deal because there's so much uh, institutional experience involved. There's so much um, more, I guess, kind of uh, inelastic demand um, for equipment and for housing so you, at that point it's a permanent army it's a professional army and every man you bring on is a soldier for 25 years where before they're called up for battle and they're dismissed afterward um, and so the republic is yeah has a hugely elastic system um, that works great in a very bloody war the imperial era it's a lot less flexible and works because they win most of their wars when they start losing a lot of men all at once um, it's like famously in the fourth century the battle of adrianople they lose about half of the army at once. The Eastern army dies uh, against the Goths. They never replace them because they lost so much institutional experience, so many officers, um, so much difficult to replace um, human and you know, actual capital um, that uh, they had to bring in barbarian levies to replace them. That becomes kind of a big problem for the army in the in going, in foregoing decades. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of the short answer that the Republican army was... Yeah, flexible imperial army had a much harder time. It's kind of like a modern army, where if you have a huge loss of men and equipment, you can't make it up right away because those men and equipment are trained, and represent an investment on the state's part, in a way that a levy is not. Yeah, I can. I, I think I can understand the difference if, uh, if, uh, correctly when uh, Hannibal was uh, doing his thing in Italy. I think uh, they trained up. Uh, couple of legions in a year or something like that, mm -hmm. which I don't think you could be, would be able to do if it was a more uh, formal uh, process. Right, right. You know, a professional force, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, as hell, they ended up enlisting slaves even, you know, they really, they really were desperate at that point. L literally everyone, yeah. Everyone, yes. Yeah. Like, oh, you can carry a spear? Okay, cool, you're in. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, so it, it becomes, you know, the Roman, the Roman Imperial Army is the, the world's first 
you know, true professional army. You can say the Assyrians, maybe or someone else, but the Romans are the ones who do it the best and for the longest. Um, and that has many benefits. You know, they're 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 very good at what they do, but it's also a lot of advantages. It becomes both stronger but also more fragile at the same time in some ways. That system. So basically, uh, it forces the uh, the empire to. Uh... You have to expand because you have to get more money to pay uh, your troops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the reason that it expands so quickly in the, in the Republican era um, is probably because they're very good. You know, the, the legions at that point, they're not professional yet, but they're almost professional. They're, they're, many of them fight for 10 years at a time. So there's they're, so many campaigns. Very experienced. Yeah. Very experienced. Um, they figure out just a model that works. You know, the legionary maniples are just better than the Hellenistic phalanx. Um, but at the same time, they're being led by men who need to have a triumph to advance politically. And so you have this aristocracy in charge in Rome that needs victories to fuel its own ambitions. And so they just keep driving further and further afield to have the next big victory. So they can come back home to Rome and say, hey, I'm a big shot. Make me your consul. Um, the emperors, oh, okay. you know, the emperors do keep conquering um, for a while. So Augustus kind of rationalizes the borders. He goes to the Rhine, to the Danube, um, but then he stops. And after Augustus, there are few conquests because it's not worth it anymore to expand. Probably because they've conquered all the good stuff. Um, you, can go east, you can go east a bit, and Mesopotamia is still pretty juicy. But besides that, you've kind of reached your your natural borders in many cases, even Britain's outside. Um, and the emperor doesn't need that victory. Um, you know, doesn't need that next big triumph to be to remain emperor. And so, in many ways, it was a political thing. Always, you know, they they could have kept conquering if they wanted to. But it made more sense for the emperors to have this professional army on distant frontiers um, that wasn't going to bother him, but would keep him in power. Uh, question about the triumphs, but first, very importantly, was uh, was there some kind of lore tradition that an army could not normally enter uh, Rome except in a triumph? Yes, exactly. Uh, so there was the sacred boundary, the pomerium um, around the city. Which was not the city wall, but just this, this ritual boundary from an early period in Roman history. Right. And according to tradition, you couldn't cross that with an army. You had to disband your legions before you could cross that mer the pomerium. And so, um, like a general like Caesar, for example, if he wanted to negotiate a triumph without surrendering his command, we have to stay outside the city, you know, remain outside, not come into the Senate himself, send emissaries um, to arrange all that. Um, of course, in the Civil War, no one cares about that march in any way, you know, <laughs> with, with, you know, with their, their troops. But there was, yes, a, a rich a tradition where you couldn't come in at the head of an army for excellent practical reasons. You know, if you have, you know, 20,000 men who, you know, want to be paid by you, yeah, it's not great to have them inside a city. Um, <laughs> so, right. So, uh, the other question I had was about the uh, triumph itself, because from what I understood, it was like something like... Uh, Massive street party and uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So what was it exactly? Um, so yes, it, it was, in theory at least, a very sacred occasion. It, it was honoring the gods. So like the, 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 the triumphator, the general who was triumphing, would color his face red with with, with clay to look like the, the statue of Jupiter um, on the Capitoline, which is made of clay. So he becomes, in effect, a god for a day, almost, uh, the, the, the general who was triumphing. Um, and he stands in his chariot, you know, with his, his slave behind him saying, remember, you are mortal, all that good stuff. Um, and uh, his soldiers behind him <laughs> trooping in um, with all of his loot and booty from his from the campaign. This includes people. So like the enemy king will be paraded on, on like a parade float almost, you know, in chains, you know, as, as you know, the man who dared to defy Rome and the people, you know, you know, boo, you know, they throw stuff at him, you know. They'll have um, you know, real parade places. They'll have dioramas, these um, like big paintings that show events from the campaigns that they parade down the streets um, during this triumph. Um, and of course, you know, they'll have the gold and silver they've seized, anything that's important, animals. You know, if they can find a giraffe, like this a giraffe, they'll bring the giraffe out. Um, and so it becomes both a way for the general to, to be, you know, God for a day, to celebrate his victory, um, for the troops to have their day on the, the day in the town, you know, to you know, parade, you know, with, with their general. Um, and ultimately for the state to, you know, assert its power at the end, because the, the general will, at the end of his, of, of the, uh, the triumph, it ends at the, the, the temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. And the general then will make a sacrifice to Jupiter, you know, for his victory. 
At that point, the enemy king will be strangled at the same time down below and then in prison in the forum to kind of, you know, to end the life of the man who tried to resist Rome. Um, and then there's a big banquet for everybody. Um, it'll be a, a that, 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 that's the street party part, but they'll bring in wine, you know, by the thousands of gallons, they'll bring in meat. Um, and the general will pretty much have a big party for the people of Rome, the whole people of Rome, um, at least in the late Republic, when this becomes very formalized. And so, yeah, it's a political gesture. It's a military, um, you know, parade. It's a, a an important ritual, and it's a a common Roman experience in a way that um, almost like a state holiday might be, like the Fourth of July in America might be, um, where it's kind of a way of going back to what makes you what makes you great. When it's in this case is killing a bunch of enemies and celebrating that fact. Um, so yeah, it's a very important occasion and one that gets the heart, I think, of Roman society in a lot of ways. How frequently would uh, would this thing happen? I mean, I, I don't think it's a yearly occurrence, even. Yeah? No, it, it's pretty uncommon. Um, you know, probably once every few years. Uh, it really depends, of course, on what's going on. That, that you have to kill a certain a certain number. You have to kill. Um, what was it? I think it's ten thousand enemies. I don't know who's counting. You have to kill a certain number of enemies to be eligible for a triumph. Because Cicero, for example. Um, he fights this very small battle um, against some bandits, pretty much, and wants a triumph. He does not deserve a triumph. He's done nothing. Um, but um, so he's, 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 he's in, he's in the, he hasn't passed musters and doesn't go over the bar into triumph territory. <laughs> um, but it, it's very political, too, of course. Being awarded a triumph means that the Senate has to award it to you. And if you're, uh, you know, if you're fighting with a faction in the Senate, you're not going to get your triumph. Um, and so it, it's probably the political gesture. Um, but it's never very common. After, and after the emperors take power, um, only they or members of their families can celebrate triumphs. So they monopolize it. Um, and so if they're not fighting a war, there's no triumph going on. Uh, there are uh, kind of mini triumphs called ovations. You can kind of, you know, have a small version of the same parade, but no one wants an ovation. Everyone wants a triumph. So you know, that, 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 that's pretty, pretty uncommon. And you mentioned that they were uh, necessary for uh, political advancement. Yes. Um, so if you are, you know, if you are in the Republican era, if you're trying to become consul, um, the most important political currency in Rome is military prestige. That is the the best way to become known as a good Roman, as a good leader. Um, both because your soldiers might vote for you um, and because you have demonstrated that most Roman of virtues, which is, you know, martial prowess. Uh, and so, yes, um, if, if you want to become um, somebody in Rome and you're not already important, you're not a member of a big senatorial family, uh, the only way to do it, unless you're a rhetorical genius like Cicero, um, is to win victories, pretty much. It is to, you know, expand the Roman Empire and gain popularity that way as a military hero. Uh, I have another question, if you don't mind, because you just mentioned uh, virtues, okay. and that, that reminded me of another question I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, going back to uh, TV shows and uh, stuff like that, we, we always, always get the impression of Romans and Greeks being, uh, you know, uh, really naughty people, like, you know, just uh, always humping each other and stuff, or... Uh, uh -huh. Other times, like they're no, they're the the model of uh, virtue mm -hmm. and uh, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there's no uh, no extreme in there. So, but uh, were they kind of uh, more conservative, less conservative than we are today, for example? With regard to other peoples, you mean, like like the Romans, like when it comes to, like accepting the Greeks or the. Uh, not just accept, accepting people, I mean, like uh, what we would call uh, public morality kind of thing. Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's hard to compare in many ways um, because, uh, yeah, the, the Romans pride themselves or claim to pride themselves on being conservative in the sense that they are devoted to the traditions of their ancestors, uh, most maiorum. Um, you know, that in their eyes, to be a good Roman is to imitate the great heroes of the past. Um, and so, you know, again, of course, the best generals, the best emperors are ones who innovate, who, you know, bring in new people, you know, who try to, uh, uh, you know, expand the empire, whatever else. But, you know, they always claim that they're being traditionalists. You know, in, in some ways, you think about the Romans in Greece, the Romans in particular, um, by our modern standards, um, they are remarkably multicultural, you know, that they, they give 
the citizenship to everybody when they meet certain criteria. Um, you know, they, they don't care about things like race. They care about, well, how rich you are pretty much and about what we can get for them. Not like they're progressive, <laughs> exactly, but uh, they have different categories of difference. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans in particular, kind of their relationship culturally is very interesting. I think almost like the uh, the English and the French in some ways, where, you know, the, for a long time they were at war, but the English admired the French, you know, French culture and French cuisine and whatever else, kind of this love-hate relationship. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the Romans, you know, in, in general, I would say, just, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, how, how we think about people, we compare them to, to today. The Romans can seem more familiar than they actually are. You know, because so much of what we of how we talk about the past, how we talk about things like culture and morality, mm -hmm. um, comes from the Romans. At least the terms do. But um, the, the Romans think about the world around them so differently in in a lot, in a lot of ways, um, where things like say slavery are totally unpro unproblematic. Things like throwing guys to lions in the arena is just a halftime show. You know, th there are all kinds of just moral differences. Um, that even when the Romans, you might read like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, one of these Stoics, and say, hey, that sounds like good life advice. And it might be. Um, but these guys are coming from a world that's so different and from a mindset that's so different from our own. Um, it's always good to remember that, I think. You know, to never lose sight of the fact that they're coming from a distant world that's not really congruent with ours. Um, and uh, as, as a historian, it's kind of my, my, my warning about comparing anything with ancient and modern. You, know, you can do it, but you just have to be careful. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, most of our thinking is based on ours, but it's just that it's based, the the, uh, the foundation has shifted a long time ago. Yes, yes, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, the, the house is still there, but it's a different foundation. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unless anyone in the chat has other questions, I was going to ask you about uh, your plans for the future for your channel, uh, the podcast and so on. Do you have any uh, new projects coming up? Or new books? Well, 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 yes, actually, and a new book. Um, oh, so right. with the channel, um, so kind of a spoiler. Um, so ne next week, uh, I'm doing a major uh, expansion of Told in Stone, where I'm releasing two new channels, actually, that will complement the main one. Um, and one will be a travel channel about travel to historical destinations in different, different places. And one sort of an extras channel where I would do things like the podcast and live streams. Nice. Um, but uh, the podcast, yes, it's coming along. I, I have three episodes out right now. I have two more ready. Um, I always interview historians, ancient historians, about different topics. But the next two episodes, um, that episode four is about public speaking in ancient Rome, about uh, above all the gestures they used uh, when addressing crowds. It's very interesting. It's, it's, it's a sign language in many ways. They didn't have amplification. They didn't have you know speakers or anything. But they could convey what they were talking about if you're in the back of the crowd, uh, what they're saying with their hands. And so it's kind of interesting to think about it in those terms. Yeah, and then um, episode five is about Roman slavery, um, what, right. what it was like to be, what it was like to be a Roman slave. Um, and so you know, all of that's happening next Friday. So you know, fingers crossed that all works. There's always technical problems that happen when you release new channels. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's hopefully I won't, 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 won't to eat my words there, but um, th th that's the big project. Um, and then for the book, um, I have a sequel, Snagged Statues, coming out uh, next September. So a little less than a year from now. And um, I will be finishing the manuscript for that in February, hopefully. Um, and so I'm hard at work now, actually, between video scripts on that. But that'll be the same kind of thing, um, where I answer questions about the Greeks and Romans um, in these you know, short you know, three to five page um, essays. You know, They're hopefully written in kind of a fun, engaging way. Yeah, I mean, the, the first one is definitely engaging. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun to read. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it it has the same uh, same voice as you do in your uh, in, in your video, so it's oh good, really yeah. really easy to understand. Oh well, fantastic! Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's what I was shooting for. Uh, that's awesome. So uh, before we sign off, I had uh, another message for the viewers from Michael from Net One Videos. suggested that uh, people jump to the uh, hangout after the stream but before we go is there anything uh, you would like to uh, tell the viewers apart uh, from well, just one more say again well it's just well, well thank you very much for watching it's been a great conversation um and, and thanks thanks carol for having me i really appreciate it i, and, I uh, love, love talking to you it's uh, it's been a, an absolute pleasure well thank you um 
and yeah, if you want to check out uh, Tone Stone, my YouTube channel, um, please feel free. It's all a lot of Roman history, uh, daily life, um, kind of fun and obscure questions. I try to answer them there. <laughs> Um, and of course, my book, um, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants, with this uh, with the fun orange cover. It's highly uh, recommended. <laughs> thank you. And so, uh, yeah, it's, thanks for listening, and, and thanks for having me. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Uh, so, thank you again for your time, Doctor, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Bye. Oh, yeah. well, thanks again. Mm -hmm.